tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mihinui kia koutou. Good morning. Just before I start, um, would the owner of a small blue planet with tectonic plates uh, please tend to your vehicle? Um, it's overheating. Uh, so if you could just look to that. Um, I would like to just talk a little bit about uh, what everyone seems to be talking about this week, which is the zero carbon bill uh, and how it underpins the transition uh, that we're on over the course of the next 30 years and beyond. It doesn't actually stop at 2050, by the way, it keeps going. Um, so I'll talk about what the opportunity is, I'll talk about what the bill does uh, and um, what that will mean. People who know me will he have heard me say this before, that uh, climate change uh, and doing something about climate change actually represents the single greatest economic opportunity in at least a generation. And I know we don't often talk about it that way. Like we often talk about it in terms of, uh, you know, some pretty gloomy scenarios for what life will look like when sea levels are 20 meters higher or, uh, you know, we've got continuous droughts in some parts of the country and, and so on. Um, and I know that if you're in an industry which is facing some of the, the kind of the steepest transitions uh, that are implied by, by this, uh, then it may not feel like the greatest economic opportunity uh, in at least a generation. Um, but I believe that it is. And part of the reason uh, for that uh, is that we've been thinking about it purely as a sunk cost. Uh, and the first question that I get asked in the media uh, is, yeah, but what will it cost? And it brings to mind uh, a, a cartoon I saw recently uh, of some dinosaurs six and a half billion years ago standing around a flip chart um, with the words asteroid mitigation program uh, at the top of the flip chart uh, and a, a, a nice wee graph with some curves on it uh, and one of the dinosaurs saying, gee, that's going to cost a lot. And you can just imagine uh, someone going, well, you know, we'd like to not have the asteroid hit us, but it's going to shave 0.2% off our GDP, so let's, let's not, let's keep doing what we're doing. Uh, so the cost of doing nothing far exceeds the cost uh, of doing something. But this isn't just about compliance, this is about saying, well, what is it that we can actually do here that's going to create better jobs, higher value industries, new innovation, new technologies uh, in the future. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you think about it as a sunk cost and you focus on it that way, that's all it's ever going to turn out to be. But if you think about it as an investment, then you would anticipate getting a return on that investment. And that is the way that we need to look at this if we're actually going to have a just transition. If we think about it as a cost, then uh, chances are we won't ever get into action, and where we do, it will not be a just transition. It'll be a transition, <laughs> but it won't be a comfortable one. Um, it'll be more akin to the kinds of things that we saw in the 1980s, which we're determined uh, to avoid. So uh, what does it take to unlock investment? Uh, and if you talk to anyone in the investment community, what they will generally say is that investment flows uh, when you've got policy stability, and some sense of predictability. One of the things that the business community says most frequently is if you can just tell me where the line is, just tell me where the line is. I might, I might not like where the line is, um, but if there's a line, then I'll invest on this side of the line, uh, and I won't invest on the other side of the line. But when there's no line, I'm just gonna hold back. I'm actually just not gonna invest much at all because I don't know where this is going. I don't know where that line's going to end up. I don't know what the future holds, so I'm just gonna, you know, spend my money incrementally and we'll kind of see how it goes, see how it plays out. And actually, if you look at New Zealand's history in relation to investment patterns and climate policy, that's roughly what's happened. There has not been massive inward investment uh, or in investment into, you know, great new technologies and, and innovations and so on. Um, and, and, and in fact, we've tended to keep on doing what we've always done. Now, I have a strong belief that innovation is a function of constraints. When times are good and there are no constraints, you tend to keep on doing what you've always done. Why mess with it? You're making money. Just keep doing what, you know, don't, don't stop doing what you're doing. Uh, when you start to get a constraint, then you have to innovate. Then you've got to get creative. 
And one of the things that fascinated me is a few years ago, about the time I first came into Parliament, and the uh, commodity price of milk globally um, collapsed, farmers were getting $4 or less than $4 uh, a litre for, uh, for their milk at the farm gate um, price. You actually saw at that point a lot of them starting to innovate, particularly around business models. So one of the things that happened in some parts of the country, Taranaki being one of them, is that some farmers de-intensified. That meant that they could reduce their input costs, sort of not having to use supplementary feed, um, lower energy costs and so on. So they reduced their input costs, managed to work out how, at the very least, to break even at $4. Uh, and then what happened was, is as the price recovered back up to 5 and $6, they were starting to make a margin. And instead of re-intensifying and driving up their input costs, they actually kept on doing what they were doing and making that margin. Now, before, when the, you know, the, the price was kind of close to $8, there was no need to innovate. Why would you? You're making heaps of money, right? So innovation is a function of constraints. And I, before I was a politician, I was in business, and I never saw anybody do anything differently when times were good. We only ever started getting creative including in my own companies, when times were really tough. So, uh, in many ways, then, climate change is the single greatest constraint and therefore the single greatest source of innovation that you could possibly imagine. But like I said, most businesses will say that what you need uh, is some kind of stable policy environment uh, and some predictability. That's, how, that's when you start to, start to say some really big deployments of you know, large amounts of capital, billions of dollars, plant that's going to last for 30 or 40 years, rather than just kind of short-term investments where you can see a short-term ROI. Uh, and so the, the zero carbon bill that we launched a couple of days ago, actually, the whole point of that is to try and create some predictability and a stable policy environment over the course of the next 30 years. Because if you look at uh, our history over the last 30 years, we've been all over the show, and people haven't been willing to make those investments. If you remember Peter Garrett's speech last night, one of the biggest problems in Australia is that they've got an incredibly unstable policy environment, and so people are very reluctant to invest when you know a change of government every few years, or in their case, every few months, uh, means that you could end up with a different policy, a different set of policy settings. So we have worked incredibly hard to try and build political consensus across Parliament to create a stable policy environment that's going to survive the next you know, three or four or five changes of government over the course of the next 30 years. That's the point, is to try and get that sense of consensus about where we're going, how we're going to end up there, uh, and what the, um, what the institutions are to guide us. So the bill does uh, a few key things. It's actually quite short, surprisingly short, given how hard it was to write. Uh, it, it, it sets uh, the goal of keeping New Zealand to within one and a half degrees of, of global warming. Uh, and of course, you remember last year, the United Nations published an incredibly sobering report which said what the consequences would be if we exceed that threshold of 1.5 degrees of global warming. To remind you, uh, you know, at, at, at one and a half degrees of global warming, we're looking at the loss of about 70% of the world's coral reefs. Uh, at two degrees, you're looking at 90%, right? That's, that's the difference between one and a half and two degrees. At one and a half degrees, the low-lying atoll states in the Pacific have a chance of retaining their territory. At two degrees, they have almost no chance. Uh, and if you can translate to what that looks like in New Zealand when you consider the increasingly frequent and severe floods and fires and droughts and storms that we're having, uh, you can see that that trend, and we're at one, one degree above uh, pre-industrial levels now, you add a half a degree to that, what the consequences of that could be. So, uh, so what we're trying to do is to say that's got to be the threshold. We're aiming for 1.5 degrees. We think it's the first piece of legislation in the world that actually puts that temperature goal into the purpose of the act. So we're pretty pleased about that because that's got to be the outcome that you want to focus on. The next thing that it does is it sets an emissions reduction target uh, for New Zealand of getting our long-lived gases, which are the ones that accumulate in the atmosphere and continue to warm the atmosphere over centuries, to get those down to net zero by 2050. Uh, and it also says that we need to reduce our short-lived, uh, you know, the kind of dominant short-lived gas of biological methane by 1% a year between now and the year 2030. And then there's a, 
a more uh, a larger range out beyond that, to between somewhere between 24 and 47 percent, which is a number that we've pulled, a range that we've has been suggested to us by the IPCC about what needs to happen globally to keep within one and a half degrees. The third thing that the bill does, it sets up a set of stepping stones, five-year emissions budgets to get us from where we are today and where we want to be in the future, to say, you know, just in any given period of time, what do we think the constraint will be? Uh, and it sets up a, a climate change commission, which has um, got experts who are politically neutral and independent of government to give us advice about what those budgets <coughs> should be and if they think is necessary to revise that long-term target because the science is moving pretty rapidly. Uh, and the final thing it does is it sets a legal requirement on the government to have a plan for how we help communities, iwi, businesses, property owners and communities to adapt to the effects of climate change. In other words, those increasingly severe floods and fires and droughts and storms. So that's what the bill does. It creates a, a long-term target, it creates uh, a series of stepping stones to get to that target. It creates an, a neutral expert-led uh, institution to help guide us the way there, and it creates obligations on the government to support communities uh, through that transition. So our intention, like I said, is to be able to create that, that um, environment that then enables people to plan to say, well, that's the constraint that we've got to live within, so therefore, what are the investments that we need to make? Now, what does that mean? Uh, it's fairly well advertised that the bill has taken longer than we had anticipated to get into Parliament. Um, and that is because it is contentious uh, and because uh, it is difficult. But if you compare it to the Paris Agreement, um, which took about 23 years, uh, if you add up all the negotiations, um, to get to, um, I, I think that we've done a slightly better job uh, of, uh, of compressing the timeline. Now, the Paris Agreement, of course, is what I would describe as a highly imperfect agreement. You could drive a fleet of buses th uh, through it. But what happened was it, it set that long-term signal and it created an enormous momentum uh, in the investment markets in particular and setting you know, a huge uh, amount of new innovation uh, in the private sector has arisen since, uh, since that occurred. And yes, uh, it has not been, uh, I guess, equally enthusiastically applied around the world. But I think what's going to happen is that the countries that are pulling their weight within a few years are going to start looking at the countries that aren't pulling their weight and saying, hang on, why are we doing all the heavy lifting here? Uh, and I think that you'll start to see that um, as a source of some tension between countries, and I think that that'll help to drag the momentum along. Um, the, the thing that... Uh, I get asked right after the question about how much it will cost is um, do we have all of the tools that are necessary to get there? And the answer to that is no, of course not. No, we don't. Uh, I know that there's a lot of attention on the debate now uh, in the agricultural sector. Um, but as I keep saying, um, no one's yet talking about the steel mill. Now, steel is a necessary ingredient in modern civilization. Uh, but they've got to work out how to get their emissions down to net zero in 30 years, and currently, uh, steel is made roughly the same way as it was made 200 years ago. And, and there, is, there is no emerging technology. There is an aluminium. We think in about five to 10 years, we'll probably have zero emission aluminium, um, but steel is, is a toughie, right? We're going to have to create that. And I'm quite fond of uh, referencing uh, Kennedy's moon speeches. There's the, there's the famous one at Rice University where, uh, you know, that, that kind of quote about, you know, before this decade is out, we're going to send a man safe to the moon, bring him back, and so on. That's the bit that people focus on. But the other speech that he gave was to Congress when he went and asked for an enormous pot of money uh, to spend and invest uh, on the technology. And the fascinating thing is that in that speech, he said, we cannot get there today. Today, we cannot get to the moon. And we intend to within 10 years, but we're going to need new propulsion systems. We're going to need new metallurgy and, and metals that can withstand the pressures of space. 
We're going to need new guidance systems and new computing systems. We're going to need to work out how to keep people alive in space and the life support systems that they need for that journey uh, and back again. We're going to need to how to get that pod through the atmosphere at temperatures r roughly half the temperature of the sun as it comes back through the atmosphere. And today we don't have that technology. We have to invent that. And then they did. And they got there in less than a decade. But if, if they'd said... Well, we think that the moon would be kind of good, but we don't have the technology, so we're not going to intend to get there until the technology is created. Well, they would never have left because they would never have had the impetus to invent the technology because they hadn't set the target. It's a circular argument. We have to say where we want to end up, even if today we don't have everything that we need to get there. And if you cast your mind back 30 years ago to 1989, those of you who were around then, New Zealand in 1989 looked as similar and as different as the world of New Zealand 30 years from now will look from today. But I have every faith that we'll make those investments, we'll create the technologies that we need, we'll reinvent ourselves just as humans always have. But if we're going to do that in a way that's just, that provides that basis for that transition, uh, we have to set ourselves that goal. Norera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Thanks, Minister. We'll take some questions from the floor shortly. Let's um, start by talking about this stable policy environment that you mentioned predictability, uh, giving people certainty, businesses and workers. How confident are you that that will hold up in future governments? Well, uh, and we have worked very hard, um, both within the parties of government and with the opposition, to try and create a framework that is supportable um, and uh, you know, we, ho we hope to have bipartisan support on that because we think that that will minimise the chances that a future government will overturn it. But you know, things are going to get harder in the future than they are today. I mean, they're already harder today uh, than they should be because we didn't get into action 30 years ago when we first had the opportunity. Um, and so there will be tremendous pressure that's applied on the political system at every step in the process. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think that there is a clear intention uh, for it to stick. And if you compare uh, it to the UK, I mean, the UK is about a decade ahead. They, they passed the Climate Change Act, about, I think, 11 years ago. They've cut their emissions 42% in 10 years. Their economy has grown faster than any other EU country in the same period of time. They've got some incredibly difficult choices a, ahead of them, and, and they're really starting to feel that friction. But the fact that they've had some momentum, I think, has helped uh, to um, assuage some of the concern. Um, about what the next step is. And I, I think the difficulty that we've got right now is, we're, is here in New Zealand, is we, it feels like we're sort of taking a step into the unknown when we haven't had that momentum in the past. But just to be clear, if this passes, none of these provisions will be entrenched, for example. The, the support of future governments will actually be required that's for this to be continued. No, that's true. And in fact, even you can, uh, in, uh, you can actually overturn an entrenched um, piece of legislation without too much difficulty. So that means that this, com this, is, not, that this is not an event-based conversation, is it? This is actually not, going yes. to require that consensus to be maintained that's in right. whatever future governments that's right. and run I, our country. And I hope, uh, and it, it is unusual in the political process, but I hope that the kind of um, uh, good faith bipartisanship that all parties have expressed uh, and have worked within provides a role model for all of our parties in the future. Your position on these issues is widely known and has been for a number of decades, I guess. Have, do you feel that you've had to water down aspects of what you wanted to do to get this into a shape that could come into Parliament? Yes, I have. Um, but there's two... There, there was one thing that I won't compromise on, uh, and that's staying within one and a half degrees of global warming. So that, and setting that goal, and in fact, every party has supported that. We've argued like Billy O about the detail below that, um, but that's, that's the most important thing, because that's the outcome that you've, that you've got to be focused on. Uh, and the other thing is I'm a believer in consensus-based politics, uh, and um, you know, ultimately consensus means that there's some give and take. 
What about urgency? We've got a question here. If we have only until 2030, why does Aotearoa seem to be planning for 2050? Well, you have to plan for both. And in fact, you have to plan for the world beyond 2050 as, uh, as well. Um, so this is going to sound like an excuse, uh, and it's not intended to be. The, um, the IPCC report talks about a window of opportunity, uh, and, um, as, and it, that's kind of been reported as, as the year uh, 2030. It's actually, it's actually slightly inaccurate. The most important thing uh, is that at any step in that way is that you can say uh, scientifically that we're um, living within that threshold of 1.5 degrees. And I think the science that we've relied on to give us the pathway that we've outlined uh, tells, has told us that, that, we, that that's where we're at. So I'm, so I'm confident of that. David, historically this narrative, I guess, has been framed around business being on one side of it yep. and uh, eco-warriors and environmentalists on the other. That narrative, I think we'd agree, is, is largely outdated. But I think people would want to know where does, an, where does a company like yours, an energy company, sit in well, this conversation? Well, I think it starts, for us, it starts with setting a goal, a setting a purpose, right? So it's bigger than the current reality that you're in. So if I just said our purpose in Z is to solve what matters for a moving world, that gives you a sense of it could be hydrocarbons today, it could be something else tomorrow, but we have choice, right? And then for me, it, it really comes down to leadership and what, what targets you're going to set, how bold they are, um, how transparent you are around what, how are you meeting those goals, and then the partnerships that you have to create. Because, you know, if there was an easy answer to this, we would have done it. You know? How do you feel about the zero carbon bill? Uh, we, we're supportive of it. We, the, the, the certainty in the long term is good for us. Um, the thing I would add to the minister's um, narrative there was it gives us a sense of a level playing field. So as well as certainty, as well as a sense of constraint, um, it gives us a level playing field to compete. And I think that is one of the things that drives the innovation for us. And what is your sense of what this means for the business sector? Does that certainty allow businesses to then make decisions in the next one, two, five years, that well, will allow them to be a player in this space. Yeah, I th my, 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 uh, my wish and my request would be you, we take, as a dialogue between business, government and, and others, we take the 30-year profile, but we actually chunk it down into manageable things now. Because I think it's quite easy to, to be uh, a bit reticent about it. It's a long-term goal, so we'll deal with it tomorrow. I think we have to get a sense of urgency into the dialogue. So I would like to see tangible um, chunking down of that target so that we're committed to acting in the short term as well. Yeah. Minister, there's a question on Slido from someone who says, given the decline in dairy sales globally, why is the government so scared to demand big dairy reduce their biological emissions to net carbon zero? We had some conversations yesterday around food. Um, those will continue tomorrow. But I think there's a sense that we have a strong cultural identity mm -hmm. around particular industries. We're proud to be Kiwis. How do you manage these conflicts as we have this conversation? Well, uh, well, the, how do we manage the conflicts is, uh, is by being in dialogue. And, and uh, you know, we have spent uh, an enormous amount of time over the course of the last 18 months um, talking with the, uh, the you know, most affected sectors, um, and, and that obviously includes uh, agriculture more generally, as well as dairy in particular. And I have to say that there has been, uh, in the dairy industry, significant movement over the course uh, of that period of time. So um, uh, Dairy NZ have uh, invested a significant amount in running training workshops about climate change, bringing scientists in to help educate farmers about you know, what's ahead, um, how different gases work and what the effects of those are. Uh, and, and that has, uh, I guess, enabled us to have a, a kind of a less uh, punch and Judy show approach yeah. to the whole thing and, and mu a much more constructive, uh, a constructive approach. I think the other thing is that when you, when you go back to kind of first principles, actually, you know, farmers along like, alongside everybody else, you know, want their kids to grow up in a world where they're not, uh, you know, completely stuffed. Uh, and, and so there's been a, a real recognition that actually that sector has to move as well. What's your sense about how the reaction has been to this over the past few days? I mean, you've obviously got people who think you've gone too far and other people who think you haven't gone far enough. Where has this landed broadly? Well, that, that's certainly been where the, where the commentary is. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've had some 
kind of, you know, the media people have been doing a bit of analysis saying that underneath the narrative of conflict that's been around the last few days, there's actually a lot of, a lot of broad support for this. And, th and that's not really coming through yet, um, but I would hope and anticipate that it will. Um, there have been, uh, in particular, uh, um, in the business community, uh, you know, a very, very strong support um, for this because it does uh, help create an, an even playing field and some predictability over the course of the, of the coming decades. Um, I think that there's clearly a lot of anxiety uh, in some sectors, and I completely understand why that would be. You know, it's, it, it, can, it can be enormously threatening, um, but I think, and, and maybe this is a, a function of how humans work and our cognitive biases, when you see a number uh, attached to a date, you see the number, but you don't see the date. <laughs> so it feels like you've got to do this tomorrow. And actually, uh, you don't need to do the whole thing tomorrow. You need to kind of get on that, get on that pathway. Um, and, uh, and, and I think the other thing is, and this, and this is a, a cognitive bias of people, is that we're much more attuned to the world that we know than the world that we don't know. It, it's incredibly difficult for human beings to choose between two options, one of which is the status quo, which is familiar to you, for an imagined future, even if that imagined future is better than, and you, and you, and you believe it to be better than the, the, the status quo. I'll come to you in a moment, Eddie. I just want to ask um, what is the most popular upvoted question on Slido from the last couple of days. It's from Yusuf. He says, will our government fund a pilot project to support farmers in fair transition from animal agriculture to livestock-free land uses? Now, I know that that's not your portfolio per se, but I do want to, I do want to acknowledge that question and I want to uh, ask you about the support that will be given to these industries because I think that is what a lot of people want to know. How, how is this actually going to come into fruition? Yeah, and look, and, th and it's a really important point and I, I, you know, and I think it's hard for people to hear this as well. Uh, we actually all have a moral duty to support the industries that are most up against it through the transition. Uh, that belongs to all of us. And I said this in my, um, my comments when we launched the bill the other day. It's actually um, patently unfair for those of us who live in cities like myself to um, ask, for example, um, agriculture to face a steeper transition than it would, o than it would already have to do if, if we're not doing what we need to do uh, and, and give up our fossil fuel cars and, and start driving electrics or hydrogen or you know, whatever it is that's, that's coming up. Um, and we all consume these products, right? I mean, we consume steel and aluminium and plastic uh, and milk and meat and, and wine and, you know, you name it. We consume these things. We actually have to be responsible for the fact that in consuming these things, we're, we're creating <laughs> demand, which creates supply. Uh, and if we want the supply to change, you know, we have to take some responsibility for, for supporting that. Eddie, what about partnerships? How do we acknowledge uh, and, and draw? We talked yesterday about bringing people to the table, all the groups that are actually stakeholders rather than just the people who typically have the power and the microphone and the influence. Yeah, I think you know, our purpose at ECA is to, uh, is to mobilise New Zealanders to be world leaders in clean and clever energy use. And, and one of the key strategic pillars of that is supporting uh, productive and uh, low emissions businesses. So we actually uh, have a program where we partner the top 100 most energy intensive uh, businesses and they're across sectors of you know, heavy industries, commercial manufacturing, uh, me, uh, dairy, meat processing, uh, agricultural processing, pulp, paper, you name it, right across, uh, across New Zealand. These top, um, top 100 represent 40% of the energy demand in New Zealand and actually 60% of the energy related greenhouse gas emissions. So our partnerships are, 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 are built on the idea of supporting these businesses. That support uh, can come in different forms and, and, and in that particular area, uh, the business area, we, we focus on uh, building those partnerships that deliver the most gain uh, and the, ultimately the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. David, someone asks on Slido, is Z really going to transition out of petrol in the next 10 years? What are your feasible options given the sense of urgency? Oh, 10 years. Uh, so our view is that hydrocarbons will be in transport fleet, will be here for decades to come. So we'll, we'll be, uh, that's our, kind of our current view. Um, we've got, um, but we realize that there is a transition happening. We've got a, a view of the pace of that. 
And all of that is, that has some science behind it, but it's uncertain. So we're, we're, we're planting seeds in other areas to pre you know, so in preparation for that. So one, one area would be our 30 million investment in biodiesel, which is a low carbon diesel is a transport fuel. Uh, the other end of the spectrum would be an investment in Flick Electric for electric um, power. You know? So we're, we're looking at that as a spectrum of options. Um, and we think that as a the decades transition but we're, we're, we're looking at that as, as a fact, that it will transition at some time in the future, and it may take longer or it may be sooner, but we're preparing ourselves for it. I think that's what I would say. Johan, when, when, when uh, Zed bought Flick, um, I, I was you know, reading some of the business pages and there was a lot of criticism of that. It's like, what are you doing? You're a, you're a, a petrol retailer. What are you doing buying a household uh, electricity uh, supplier? Uh, and I thought that criticism um, just illustrated how um, blinkered people are. Because, so I, I drive a, a, an electric car, I charge it in at home, uh, in the garage, and I'm not actually a Flick customer, but um, yet. Uh, yet. <laughs> one day we'll all be Flick customers, right? <laughs> Buy our product. Um, and, and so to me, that was, like, that was a prescient investment. Yes. You know, it said, okay, well, if you can tell that, you know, that, that you're not, not going to be a petroleum uh, um, retailer uh, forever, what's the next thing that's going to get people around? Well, it looks like it's going to be electricity, so sell them electricity. And sell them where they're going to use it, which is at home, not in a forecourt. I think that's one, one point I wanted to point to. When you make those moves and you surprise people, because there is an element of surprise when you make moves like that, you have to be able to stand strong for your commitment. So we, we took some flack on that, and we'd have to stand strong for the reasons why and continue it to explain the narrative about why we're doing those things and what we're preparing ourselves for. It's all in the dialogue at one sense. You know? and, 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 that's, and that's one of the big barriers that we see in our partnerships program um, with regard to an investment is actually leadership taking that bold step. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, we, we fully encourage and support that. And, and really what we're seeing is uh, at the governance level that there is a desire and understanding to make change uh, however, the flow through to the operational environment of organisations is really challenging. Mm. I want to come to this issue of how we include rangatahi in this discussion um, at the end of this session, but I just want to stay on this, this topic about consumer behaviour and, and choices. Uh, there was a question there that's just disappeared about banning internal combustion cars. I mean, how far will you go in the next few years if you stay in government? Well, the... the I can't, I can't say what's coming through the pipeline, um, but there's, there, there is an active program of work to say, well, ha, you know, how, how do we in the peculiar nature of New Zealand's vehicle market um, uh, do that? Um, it has been a frustratingly slow process because the kind of policy instruments that have worked in Norway, for example, um, just don't translate easily into the New Zealand uh, environment because, of, because essentially our markets are, are actually just so different. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously I would like us to move as fast as is as possible there. There is a distributional effect, so if you, uh, you know, one of, amongst OECD countries, we're comparatively low income with other high income countries. Um, and one of the ways that we've offset the fact that we're a low income country is by lowering the cost of um, the vehicles that we drive, or, or that we buy, rather, than, than we drive, by having very cheap um, second-hand vehicles with no emission standards. Um, and that means uh, that people can afford to buy a cheap vehicle to help them get around. And so if we're going to shift uh, you know, up the chain, which we absolutely have to, the complicating part is how you manage that in relation to, to low-income families who've got fewer, fewer options. I mean, that's, you know, we're investing $14.5 billion in rapid transit and light rail and, and buses and cycling and all that kind of stuff over the next 10 years to, to help, but that's not going to work for everyone. So that, that's the kind of conundrum that we're working through. David, are you waiting for consumers to more significantly change their behaviour? I know you're investing in this stuff and you're looking at it and all that type of stuff. Is that what you're wanting from New Zealanders? Is that a signal that you want from we your consumers? We need a signal from consumers, right. for sure. You know, you know, if, for instance, take biodiesel. We have, a, we have a, um, upwards of 20 million litre plant coming online. We, we still have no certainty as to put whether people are going to buy that yet. Yeah. Right? So I think um, 
we do look for signals, but we realize that we have to be in front of the curve, yes. offering things, making it easy for people to get the product. And giving them the information. And about giving what's them available. the information and being transparent about the cost of it and um, the carbon abatement potential. All that stuff needs to be really open. So I, I would say we have, businesses have to be ahead but we need feedback. Eddie, sure. isn't there a massive education piece that's missing in all of this? The lack of literacy around this and the fact that consumers, who are just many of them struggling to put food on, food on the table and look after their families, who don't have the time to read policy documents, mm. don't re necessarily know all this stuff and find it hard to get that information. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think there is certainly a, a barrier. We're focused very um, heavily on that education piece. And, and in the next 12 months, plan to roll out a series of um, uh, uh, campaigns to educate the consumer or the everyday New Zealander on carbon reduction and what their carbon footprint looks like and how they can make a change. And, and we've done some uh, initial research on the level of understanding and the level of understanding uh, is poor across the population. So, so we've got clearly a lot of work to do there in the education space but also we do have a, a core group of activated New Zealanders who understand and can share the message. This question here, Minister, why not call it the Climate Crisis Commission? Change doesn't really grab our attention, crisis does. Uh, well, I look forward to your submission uh, to select committee. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a good point, actually. There's been some commentary in the last few days about the language that we use and whether it's actually communicating uh, what, needs, uh, what needs to happen. Um, and, you know, I, I guess uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions on, on, on kind of anything because it's certainly, if you look back at our history, we haven't moved with anything like the momentum that's necessary. We were talking yesterday about nudging versus compelling. Is it both... Is, yeah. it, is the time for nudging over? Is it the time for compulsion? No, the, well, the, it's, it, well, it is both, mm. right? Um, and uh, in some cases, you know, one strategy uh, works better than the other, and, and I think you have to kind of be wise about um, picking and choosing those things. I mean, the, the, the thing is that, that what, what we have to do is um, just be very careful about creating resistance, you know? So uh, I guess a big part of the way that I've tried to work over the course of, of the last 18 months as we've put this thing together is to do it in a way that, that lowers res resistance. And, and one of the examples I use is, uh, you know, you've got to start by acknowledging the anxiety that people are facing when you say you've got to completely change the way that you're doing everything. And in some cases, it's a matter of personal identity, right? I mean, if you say to a coal miner on the west coast, uh, whose father was a coal miner and their father was a coal miner, that actually we don't want your product anymore. You're not just saying we don't want your product anymore, we're saying we don't want you anymore. It's a deeply personal rejection. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it that way, it's no surprise that you get the kind of resistance uh, and the kind of denial that we've but seen. But this is my point, because we talked about this on a panel that had Ke uh, Kevin Haig on it yesterday and we talked about the west coast and mm. we talked about these coal mining families and the fact that there is a poverty of imagination and communication to actually say to these 16 17 18 year olds there is another future that's emerging yeah this is what it looks like you know when we talk about future jobs you're not going to be riding around hover on hovercrafts there are real jobs that they can get their head around and go i'm going to take that I'm going to take that step and take that risk rather than doing what my family's done for generations and trying to earn 100k in a coal mine. Yeah, look, I, so I, I completely agree with you, but I don't think it's entirely, I don't think we can blame that person, that 18 year old who's Absolutely grown up in that not. history with that heritage for having, having a worldview that they've inherited. My family, you know, were farmers in the um, Eastern Bay of Plenty for five generations. 100 years they worked, uh, they worked that farm. I was the first one that, that was born and grew up in the city. Uh, and, and yet I almost think of myself as coming from that part of the country because all of the stories of my family are from there and they're about the, the farm and about riding around on horses on the beach, uh, you know, down at Waifaro and, and all of that kind of thing. And yet I've never lived there, but I've inherited all of that mm. culturally. Uh, and so it, do, it does shape us enormously in terms of how, how we think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Aru Valley in the, in the middle of Wellington, you know, and, and, and you know, that's kind of who I am, but, but it's extraordinary how much pull that, that, that heritage has, uh, has on me. So uh, as we go through this, I'm not, this is no uh, excuse for not doing anything that we're doing. 
what it's doing is saying how we do it. Yes. Is we have to take everyone with us and we have to leave no one behind. And what that means is we have to acknowledge people's history and their values and what they believe is important and to say we get it. We're going to work with that energy, not against it. But that's, my, that's exactly my point and my question is how do we provide those young people with an alternative vision yeah. that allows them to acknowledge where they've come from but mm. actually see that there is a different future and mm. there's a transition that they can play a role in? Whose responsibility is that? Well, that's all of our, that's all of our responsibility. That's, that's the, it is the government. We do need to invest. Um, it is local government in terms of the kind of the work that you see here in Taranaki about creating that, um, you know, that kind of plan for the future. Um, it, it is the private sector, and there are parts of the private sector that need to really lift their game. Not, you know, you, there's some amazing examples of, of leading businesses who, are, who have really grasped this, this transition. Um, it, it is actually conversations uh, in, those, uh, in those families, but we've got to invest in that future. And like I said in my opening remarks, we have to treat it as an investment, because the more we treat it as this, this you know, phenomenally expensive sunk cost, we will just always resist it. It'll just be like, well, why would I do that? David, different businesses in different industries sit at different points in the spectrum yes, on this. Yes. How, do, how do we unite the business community around these issues? Well, I think it's collaboration. You know, the, um, the, the recent um, Climate Leaders Coalition, which I think is one of the biggest things I've seen, I think globally as well, where you have 80 seven or 85, 87 uh, of New Zealand's businesses getting into a dialogue and being transparent about what they're doing and at least opening the books uh, at one level, you know, and making a stand for the, the Paris Accord. I mean, that's, that speaks volumes. I think that's, and that's just the start, you know. So I think it, all, it is about open dialogue at pace, you know, um, and things like that I think are a big, big step forward. Do any of you John, want to? Sorry, can I just pick up on this point? Go because th this is something that we need to celebrate in this country, and it's not widely known. Um, the Climate Leaders Coalition, 87 businesses and climbing, they collectively represent a quarter of our gross domestic product. That's an enormous chunk uh, of, our, of our economy. They collectively, with their suppliers, represent half of our entire emissions. And they've all committed to science-based targets and yep. reducing emissions in line yep. with that temperature goal. Now, you compare that to other b um, climate business organizations around the world, some of, them, some of the strongest activity, ironically, is actually in the United States. But their equivalent of the Climate Leaders Coalition over there represents 5% of their emissions, right? As a proportion of their economy, their leading businesses represent, you know, an incredibly small part of their overall economy, whereas we've got this group here, led by the uh, largest um, uh, fossil fuel retailer, who are saying actually we need to we need to grapple with that and it's um, it, it's that's half our emissions between 90 yep. companies you know and and if and their suppliers and if we, if we can work with that energy you know that that gives me colossal hope we're out of time but i want to finish with um, a theme that's come through a lot of the questions around young people and their role in this conversation we'll start with you eddie i'd like to hear from each of you yep. um, about how we bring young people to the table on this I think young people are at the table already. I, I really do. I feel like um, you know the the activism that you're se you're seeing globally and w within New Zealand. You know, certainly young people are um, uh, are trying to engage in the conversation. So I think we embrace that more. Is is what I'd like to see, constructive. David, your view? Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same. I think we should listen to them. What does uh, that look like? Uh, well, opening your ears to to the fact that if we believe that, that we, you know they're inheriting the planet that we, you know, we are affecting. I think we should listen to them and treat them with respect and treat them that they have ideas that we might be blocked with. So, you know, one example of this would be in the Climate Leaders Coalition, we're just about to set up a, what we're calling it, Climate X, which is effectively a entrepreneurial workshop where you get young heads in to give their views and, and, and listen to their views and let them create something with you. So I think, I think it's about that. Bring them into the debate and allow them to help you make better mm. decisions. Not just like, play with it, you know, but actually allow them to influence you. I think that's, that's quite inspiring, actually. Minister, groups like Generation Zero, for example, to what extent have they influenced uh, the Zero Carbon Bill and, and where you're at? Well, I mean, the Zero Carbon Bill came from Generation Zero, right? So that... The, you know, a, a group of young people actually put this um, proposition up and said, actually, what we need is an act that does these, uh, that does these things. And it so beautifully encapsulated it in, in its kind of simplicity and clarity. It, it, you know, we adopted that. So 
you know, this bill that everyone's shouting about at the moment was the brainchild of a youth uh, movement, which I, I, I think we should applaud them for, you know. Um, the, uh, the climate strike, uh, sorry, the school strike for climate that occurred, um, uh, sadly, on March the 15th, uh, you know, I went and spoke at the Wellington rally on, on Parliament lawn, and there were three times as many people out there that morning as the climate marches before the Paris Agreement. You know, three times as many people. Uh, there's a huge amount of uh, momentum then. Um, and, and I know that they're gearing up for, uh, for more and, and, and good on them. And, I, and it was really interesting watching the um, response of adults to the idea that kids were going to go on strike uh, for the climate. Um, you know, people were saying things like, well, you know, they should um, stay in school and study so that when they, you know, eventually take over and blah, 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 you know. Um, like, the same people who, if their kid was sick, they would say, well, you should take a day off because you're sick. You know, so there's no, no problem missing a day of school if you're sick. But, you know, fighting for your future and the future of the planet, that's... Um, because those parents yeah. never protested when they were yeah, young. Yeah, right? precisely. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and, and the th as, actually, as one, as one of the uh, organisers said, or one of the comments I saw reported in the newspapers, adults think nothing of going on strike to improve their wages. Um, why shouldn't we be allowed to go on strike to save our future? Um, and, and so I, th I think some of the kind of, I, I thought some of the comments were really condescending. But there's, no, there's currently no formal structure for young people to, um, to be engaged in this and to have a voice in this. And I think that uh, there needs to be. I mean, the year 2050, the year we're all shouting about, I'm going to be 77 years old. Uh, you know, I'm going to be lucky to be here. <laughs> um, and I, ho I hope to be kind of, I don't know, fishing or something. So, um, you know, th these kids will be in their 40s. They'll be my age. They'll be in the middle of their careers. They might be, you know, married. They might not be. They might have children of their own. They might not. You know, th th they, th they will be um, the generation that is having to live within this. So I think that we need to think about how we can formally bring that voice in, into the, into the, into the stru structurally uh, in, into our decision-making processes. Because actually, when you think about it, it's actually the most important voice of all. And it's one thing to be uh, having a voice on the street, it's another thing to have a voice at the table. Right? That's right, that's right. So we've, I, you know, I think that they've done pretty well kind of kicking the door in. <laughs> um, but, but actually, it should be an open door to start with. Minister David and Eddie, thanks very much for your time. Cheers. Thank you.